Yes, everybody who want, all who want to be happy, let me see your hand. Amen. Yeah, everybody wants to be happy, right? We wish that we could be happy all the time. Um, unfortunately, uh, sometimes we are not in that place where we, we, we would say to others, I'm not happy right now. I'm sad. I'm despairing. I don't feel happy. And so we began the question last week, what is happiness? Um, why is it uh, so elusive? Only last night, my wife and I are looking at some documentary, and the guy is saying, what is happiness? Happiness is the smell of a new book. <laughs> so everyone is searching for this elusive thing called happiness. And we found that in the book of Revelation, the final book in the Bible, God pronounces seven blessedness. In other words, uh, he's giving us the secret to this thing called happiness. And it's not what most of us think it is. Most people attach happiness to a sentiment, how I feel. Some attach it to what I have, what I possess. If I have money in the bank, enough to um, take me through to my retirement and beyond, and maybe to leave something for my, my grandchildren, that will make me happy. Um, if I have good health, if I have a good family, good relationship, those things will make me happy. But then we find that people like Bob Marley, Kurt Cobain, uh, Howard Hughes, um, Elvis Presley, um, Whitney Houston, and all of these people had more money than we could imagine for lo several lifetimes. They had fame. They had reached the pinnacle of fame and recognition in this world. And every name that I named um, this moment, every one of them committed suicide. Every one of them destroyed themselves with drugs, overeating, um, despair, and every one of them, despite getting all the money, despite getting all the fame, reaching the top of the pyramid in this world, they all ended their lives. So evidently, happiness is not in money. Happiness is not in fame, popularity, and all of these things. It is something else. And in the book of Revelation, and the book of Revelation is all about chaos. Chaos. If you want chaos, you have to read the 5th to the 19th chapter of the book of Revelation. It describes the seven years after the church is removed from the world, that period called the Great Tribulation, when two men will take a stranglehold on the earth. Two men, the Antichrist and the false prophet, bringing about a one world government and a one world religion, and state and religion will come together to take a stranglehold on this world. <coughs> and who refuses their mark, who refuses to join their party, will be killed. It's a terrible, terrible time on earth. Nineteen judgments will be poured out, seven trump six trumpet judgments, six uh, seal judgments, and seven bowl judgments will be poured upon the earth in that seven year period that the church will be will be removed. And in that seven year, half of the world's population will be killed. The sea will be destroyed, turned into blood. All marine life and shipping will be destroyed. It will be a terrible time. The Bible says, never before in the history of the world would the world see such a time, nor afterwards. Yet in this time of crisis, in this time of hopelessness, this is the time in which God interjects these seven secrets of staying together, of being happy, of finding blessedness. When you see the word blessed appearing in scripture, it is the same word for happy. So we go to the Beatitudes, blessed are the poor in spirit. It's the same word as happy are they who are experiencing poverty or humility of spirit. Right? So blessedness and happiness is one and the same word. Last week, I defined happiness using uh, the Hebrew word from which it originates. That word is called asher, A-S-H-A-R. And what it points to is finding the right path 
in the midst of many paths. And the analogy I gave is assuming you are walking in a forest and you come to a fork and you say this one path that you are walking on, it forks off into many places and many different directions. Which one do you take? Which one is the right one to follow? Right? Solomon tells us there is a way that seems right to a man, but the ends thereof are the ways of death and destruction. So there is a way that seems a road starts okay, but then it branches off at a certain point, and you have to make a decision, which way am I going to go? Which is the right path? So Asher, which is blessedness, is being able to choose amidst the multiplicity of different paths that are suggested to us, which is the path that is right. And this is what the scripture uh, teaches us and helps us to find. So we have all these forking off paths. We have, and some are pulling us because of tradition. My father wants me to do this. My parents want me to follow this path. Some are pulled by friends. All my friends are taking this path. Some are being pulled by financial lucrativeness. This is the best path for you to make a good living, regardless whether it's your inclination or your natural disposition. And so all these forces are beckoning me to come. Come on my path. Come on my path. But which is the path that God wants us to follow? We looked at Psalm 139, and we know that God made us fearfully and wonderfully. And God deposited a gift in us that will make room for us in this world. And so how do we find that gift? How do we find that path that will open up opportunities for us in this life, right? And we talked about, last week we talked about, blessed is the person who read the words of this prophecy and who hear it and who keep it. Those three commands, blessed is the person who reads, hears, and keeps the words of the prophecy. Now this seems to be a very, a very interesting um, kind of promise that God has given to us. Because if there is one book in the Bible that we stay away from, and not because of fear, but because of misunderstanding, because of confusion, because we don't seem to think we could interpret what all these symbols and all these signs and all these beasts are about, we stay away from the book of Revelation. How many of you get up in the morning and say, it's time for my devotion, I'm going to read the Bible, and you turn to the book of Revelation? Most, most of us don't. We stay away. We don't want to touch this book with a 10-foot pole. You know, we would go to the Psalms, we would go to the Proverbs, we'd go to the Gospels, and we kind of dwell in those nice, safe places. We don't want to touch the book of Revelation. Yet, of the 66 books in the Bible, God gave, gave us the promise of a blessing to the person who keeps the words, who hears the words, who keeps it, and who reads it. He gives the blessing only to one particular book. And it's not the book of Psalms. God didn't say blessed is the person who reads, hears, and keeps the words of these Psalms or these Proverbs or the lovely love, uh, the love story of Ruth and Boaz or Jacob and Rachel and what the distance he would go in order to get this, this girl's hand. It was none of those. God is telling us of the 66 books in the Bible, I'm attaching blessings to the person who is willing to take a whole of this book, regardless of all its, its difficulty, its all its signs, its all its complexities, its chronological difficulties, the person who will read the words, keep the words, and hear the words of this prophecy, the book of Revelation, to them I will give a blessing. So I want, to, I want you to keep that in mind. That of the 66 books in the Bible, this book, with all its challenges, is the one to which God assigns blessedness. I will bless those 
who keep the words of this prophecy. That was last week. So this week, I want to look at the second of these seven blessings that God promises and releases to the people in this time of chaos on earth called the Great Tribulation. Of these seven blessings, actually, two are the same. It's like the book uh, covers of a book. The first prophecy, the first blessing is blessed are they who keep the words of this prophecy. The last one, the seventh one in chapter 22 of Revelation is blessed are those who keep the words of this prophecy. So God is repeating the first blessing. He's repeating at the end. He's bookending the seven blessings with these two. And so God is kind of saying, hey, in the mouth of with two witnesses, every word is established. So I'm kind of compounding this blessing with these book covers and let you know everything else is kept in between. So the second blessing that we want to talk about is found in Revelation chapter 14 and verse number 13. Then I heard a voice from heaven saying to me, Write, blessed are the dead. So that's the word blessed, happy. Happy are the dead who die in the Lord. So not everybody is happy who die. Not everybody's blessed to die. Blessed are the dead who die in the Lord. You die as a Christian. You die with your faith in Jesus. Blessed are they who die in the Lord from now on. Yes, says the Spirit, that they may rest from their labors and their works follow them. <clears throat> this second interjection of blessedness juxtaposed between the devastation caused by the 12 trumpet and seal judgments. So this promise, this promise of blessedness is given after God has already poured out the six trumpet judgments and the six seal judgments upon the world. I said to you earlier that there are 19 judgments that will be poured out upon the earth in this period called the Great Tribulation. Twelve have already been poured out, the seven trumpets and the seven seals. The seven final bowl judgments, which are more terrible than anything else that has been released upon the earth, there is a pause between this 12 and that final 7. And in that pause, this is where God releases this blessing. This is where God releases that blessing. Then I heard a voice saying to me, Blessed are the dead who die in the Lord, and they rest from their labors, and their works follow them. The Antichrist will seek to replace God in the holiest of all, we know, with the statue of himself. And this idolatrous act will make the Jews realize this man is an imposter. This is what's going to happen. After the church is removed from the earth in the rapture, the world is now left without a voice. It is now left without a prophetic voice. What will happen? During this great tribulation, the Bible says where sin abounds, grace abounds much more. But God has taken the church out of the earth, out of the world. Who will now preach to these people who are left? Whilst this bombardment is happening, where will grace come from? Where will the voice of hope come from? Well, the Bible tells us God never leaves the earth without a prophetic voice. And during this time... God will seal 144,000 Jews, 12,000 from each tribe. God will also appoint three angels, and there will be two witnesses who are unnamed. Most people believe it will be Moses and Elijah based on the type of miracles they will perform. And these will form the evangelistic team during this time when the church is gone. So these 144,000 Jews these three angels who will be flying around the earth proclaiming, fear God and give him worship for the time is at hand. That's their message. They'll be preaching, the Bible says they'll be preaching the everlasting gospel. So whilst the 144,000 Jews and the two witnesses 
will be confined to ministry in the land of Israel, these angels will be going around. The Bible says they'll be flying in the midst of heaven, which means all the world will be hearing the gospel from them. Amen. And so um, when this happens and during this time of great tribulation, uh, as the church is gone, the Antichrist will appear. He can't come yet. The Bible says only until he that restrains is taken out of the way, 2 Thessalonians chapter 4, only when he who restrains is taken out of the way, then the man of lawlessness will appear. Right? So whether the church, the world wants to admit it or not, the world is being preserved because of Christians, the presence of Christians in this world. And I don't say when I say Christians, I don't mean everybody who calls the name of Jesus or who says they're a Christian, but the true church of Jesus Christ. And I'm not the one to determine who's the true church of Jesus Christ, but the Bible says God knows them that are his. God knows them that are his. So he will come for that ecclesia, the true church, the true believers, to remove them. And then when the church is gone, the man of sin, the Antichrist and the false prophet, will now have an open season to come and to take control. And it's during this time, in the middle of the tribulation, the Antichrist actually will make a peace treaty with Israel. And that covenant he establishes with Israel will make them believe that he is their Messiah. But what happens in the middle of this seven-year period? The Antichrist and the false prophet are in alliance. And the false prophet makes an idol, a statue of the Antichrist. And he puts him in the holiest of all, which means that Israel will rebuild the third temple. But they have no ark. The ark is lost. Since Nebuchadnezzar destroyed Babylon in 586 BC and ransacked the temple, there is no place where no one, has no, no one knows where the ark is, was taken. Some say it's in Ethiopia, some say it's in different parts of the world, some say Josiah hid it in tunnels under the temple when he recognized or realized that the Babylonians were coming to invade. But no one knows where it is. So the second temple that was rebuilt by Zerubbabel after the destruction and after the return of the exiles under Cyrus the Persian, they came back to rebuild Jerusalem and rebuild the walls and rebuild the temple. They rebuilt the temple they put all the furnishings in it, but they did not have the ark. And the ark is the main thing. The ark represents the presence of God. So when Jesus came, there was also a temple. Zerubbabel's temple had been enhanced by Herod the Great and made into a beautiful place. That remnants of it, the wall, the wailing wall, are still parts of it. But still, that temple, when Jesus came, that temple, if you went into the holiest of all, it was empty. And many people said that what they did was to put a stone in the place where it is supposed to be. And so in the middle of the tribulation, the Antichrist will command everyone to worship the image of the beast. Rather, the false prophet will command everyone to worship the image of the beast. And people are going to, the Jews are going to recognize that this man is not our Messiah. He's an imposter. Because first and foremost in the minds of Jewish people are the first two commandments of the Ten Commandments. You shall have no other God before me. You shall make no graven images to me. And so all of a sudden, the false prophet makes this image of the beast, puts it in the Holy of Holies, and maybe through AI or whatever, this thing is now speaking. It is commanding people to worship, worship the beast. The Jews recognizing that they're not to bow to any image, they will recognize that this man is not the Messiah, and they will break, and then having recognized that, the Antichrist now breaks the covenant he made with them, and he unleashes mayhem, trying to destroy them. Jesus in Matthew 24 says, when this happened, run for the hills, escape, leave whatever things you have behind, don't look back, just run for your life. That's the period of time he was talking about when he says, when you see the abomination of desolation, that phrase refers to this image that the Antichrist and the false prophet puts in the holiest of all and command worship. 
So you don't take that worship, you don't uh, take that mark of the beast, then you will suffer and die. So what happens in the middle of this tribulation when all of this takes place? People begin to run. They begin to try to flee. The Jews are running to Petra. They're running to different places, escaping for their lives. But not everyone escapes. Not everyone makes it. Many are killed. And so we know this because in the vision, John saw the souls of many under the altar in heaven. And he asked the angel, he says, who are they? And the angel says, these are they who were killed in the great tribulation. These are they who were martyred for their faith. These are they who refused the mark of the beast and suffered martyrdom for it. And so <clears throat> all of this is the preamble to this statement, blessed are the dead who die in the Lord. The people are asking, those who have escaped the Petra, those who managed to escape the different parts, are now asking about their family. Where are my family members? Did they make it? And they would hear the news. Not everybody made it. Some are killed. Some are martyred. Some have lost their lives. And so people are naturally now asking, you know, what is, what is the future? Um, what, is the, what is the status of our brethren who did not make it to safety? Were they killed? And if so, where are their souls? Are they in pain or in rest? Will they be forgotten for their heroic resistance of false religion and forced political allegiance? Will they be rewarded for refusing assimilation into the beast's satanic cult in that they refused his mark on their bodies? Will God honor them for refusing to bow to the image of the beast? In other words, was their martyrdom worth it? This proclamation was the answer to all their fears, doubts, and sadness. It was what they needed to hear more than anything else during this awful time in their lives. God wanted them to hear it, but not just to hear it, but to have it written down. Look at that word. Then I heard a voice from heaven say to me, write. God doesn't often say write. Many of the times God would come in the Old Testament and he would say to a prophet, speak to the people of Israel, speak to these people and say, thus said the Lord. Much of it is a revelation that is passed on and proclaimed by word of mouth. So when God says write, it is moving from just, you know, speaking to keeping a permanent record of something. Pretty much when God wants us to keep something that is fundamental, that will have no alteration to it, he always puts it in writing. So lots of different things were given to Moses on Mount Sinai, but God was going to write a portion of it, and he wrote the Ten Commandments with his own finger carved on those stone tablets. So you can have fluctuations, in understanding rituals and ceremonies and festivals and all the different things associated with civil and uh, civic life in Israel. But when it comes to moral and spiritual life, God was not going to allow anyone to modify or alter those fundamentals. So God wrote with his own finger the Ten Commandments. And then God said to them when they were leaving, you will store those tablets of stone in the ark and take them with you. So as time passed, years passed, centuries passed, and if people wanted to be reminded of what God said, they, no, the priest took out the stone tablets and he read. So 200 years later, there is no alteration, there is no modification, what was said is kept intact. And so there is no um, change. We don't have to question the authenticity of the Ten Commandments or the things that God commands to write. So here he commands John to write. 
This is actually one of 14 times that God commands his servants, be it men or angels, to write down something he wanted to relay his, to his people. Writing leaves a record that the people of that day and others through the centuries can refer to without worrying about its authenticity. If a message is passed down by word of mouth, chances are that it will become corrupted with time. But when it's written down, it will remain just as it is. All right? So John is commanded to write, Blessed are the dead who die in the Lord. They may rest from their labors, and their works follow them. So there are two assurances given here concerning the departed saints. Two assurances. They are blessed or happy because they are at rest from their labors, and their works continue to follow them. I want to expand on these assurances, after which I will answer the important question, how does the state of the, you know, of the blessed dead, how does, how does the state, knowing that the dead um, are at rest and are enjoying the fruits of their labors, supposed to make us happy? Remember, we are looking at the subject of happiness. And he's saying, happy are those who are at rest in the Lord, who have moved on. And so we are going to say, I'm alive. What does that have to do with my happiness? So that's what we are examining now. So the dead are at rest from their labors. The assurance that the dead are at rest from their labors brings comfort to us on two fronts. The first is that if we remain faithful to Jesus, we will be reunited with our loved ones in the future. They are not lost to us. This is one of the great assurances that we have as believers in Jesus. King David's heart was calmed in the death of his son with the assurance, I shall go to him, but he shall not return to me. 2 Samuel 12 and 23. And likewise, we all have this assurance, blessed are the dead who die in the Lord. Anybody who's, for you loved ones who have passed on in the Lord, they are not lost to us. You will see them. I will see my father, my mother, my sister, who have gone on to glory. And it will be a forever reunion. God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There shall be no more death, nor sorrow, nor crying. There shall be no more pain, for the former things have passed away. Revelation 21 and 4. So blessed are the dead who die in the Lord. We're looking at a question, what makes me happy? Many people are sad because they don't know where their loved ones are. They don't know, you know, if they died without Jesus, where are they? They're hoping that they made it. Hoping last minute they made a decision, because that decision doesn't have to be by word of mouth. It can be in my heart, you know, so we don't know. We have to keep preaching the gospel because who knows, at the very last moment, someone may just in their heart uh, receive Jesus. But we have this assurance that we will see our loved ones again. And that should make us happy, shouldn't it? Amen? should make us happy. This is one of the great promises we have as Christians. People of other faiths are unsure um, of what happens after they die or their loved ones die, but not us. The arrival of Moses and Elijah 700 and 1,000 years after their removal from the earth, their return to be with Jesus on the Mount of Transfiguration um, <clears throat> remind us that uh, the dead in Christ are not only alive, but are still actively engaged in kingdom work. And the resurrection of Jesus puts that stamp on our own resurrection and immortality. Because he lives, we shall live also. If we died with him, we shall also live with him. 2 Timothy 2 and 11. And secondly, the faithful in Christ will one day rest from their labors while they continue to accrue the benefits of their work. To rest from your labors does not mean we will enter into a sort of eternal retirement when we leave this life. A place in which we kick back in a hammock and chill for the rest of our existence. No, 
we were made to work. You observe, when God made Adam, do you know what he did? In 2 Genesis chapter 2, verse 7, God formed man from the dust of the ground. Do you know what the next verse said? And God planted a garden in Eden and put the man there to work. There was no break between his creation and his assignment to work. We were made to work. We were not made just to work on earth. We will continue to labor in heaven. You know, maybe people had the sense that God is just, you know, God made the world in six days. And the Bible says on the seventh day, God rested. And um, maybe people are just saying or thinking in their heads, uh, you know, God is this now old guy with a long white beard. He's done his part and he's just gone into this hammock where he's resting uh, for the rest of his existence. Well, that's not what God is about. And that's not what rest is about. God rested uh, from his labors. And just in case some people think that means God is inactive, that God has created a world and renovated the world in, seven, in six days, and on the seventh day he rested, means he's gone into the sort of retirement mode. When Jesus turns up, one of the things Jesus keeps saying is that to this hour, my father is working and I am working also. God is at work. God is always working. Jesus said the works that I do are not my own. They're the works I see my father doing. The words I speak to you are not my own. They're what I hear my father saying. So God is, Jesus makes it clear to us that God is at work. He's always working. Take a look at Jesus as well. Jesus could have said, hey, you know, I did my part. I came on earth. I went through all of the stuff, did what I had to do, and I gave my life, the suffering of the cross, went down to hell, preached to the spirits in prison, led captivity captive, and now I'm seated beside the Father, and I could just chill. But what does he do? The Bible says he's seated at the right hand of the Father, making intercession for us. The book of Hebrews says he lives ever to make intercession for us. So Jesus did not leave and say, all right, did my part. You guys, the church, you do the rest. Jesus continues. He never broke stride. He's just moved the, the scene of his labor from earth to heaven. And he's moved his, his type of assignment into a different mode. Here he labored, and now he's at the right hand of God. And the Bible says he is, he is of a high priest who's in the heavens. So as a high priest, he's making intercession for us. So he's working. He's laboring. This is what he's doing. All right? And the Bible says, and he gave them the final, what we call the Great Commission. Go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. Right? And I'm going to be with you. Well, in what way is he going to be with us? In what way is Jesus with us? When you go about your daily chores every, every day, are you aware that Jesus is with you? And then you can say, yeah, I know my God is with me, in the sense that God's presence for me, it's the atmosphere, and he's everywhere, he's omnipresent. But in what way is God with us? If God is not this passive individual, God is always active, always at work, and incidentally, he works harder than every one of us. Because how many of us here work more than five days a week? God worked six days and took one day rest. And we don't even want to work the five days. Everyone is clamoring around the world now for a reduced work week to four days and three days. We're getting lazier and lazier. That's not like our father. God worked six days. We are doing five and some less. <laughs> and some are five days at work, the workplace, but not necessarily at work. <laughs> I don't want to say government servants, but... <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, you know, our God is at work. He's a, he's a busy guy, and God wants us 
to work. So we have a very interesting dynamic happening. God worked, and then God went into a rest. But Jesus comes 4,000 years later and says, my father is working. So how can you be at rest and you're still working? What does that mean? It simply means that God is working from a place of rest. What does that mean? What does it mean to be working from a place of rest? In simple, in a nutshell, it means to be working from a place of purpose for which you were made. It is to be working from that place. We talk about different paths. It's to find your path when you find what God has put you on the earth to do and you walk in it. It is not a stressful thing. It is something that is lovely, that is wonderful, that you look forward to because you are built just for that. This week is the closing week of the Olympics. And, you know, the uh, finals for the basketball um, uh, tournament was between the USA and France. And the USA won. For the fifth straight time, they won the gold medal um, in basketball. And the two heroes for that U.S. team are the two people, the two men, that most people expect would be heroes. LeBron James and Steph Curry. The two of them carried the U.S. to victory. And the question is, what motivates guys who have more money than you can dream of, billionaires, who have all the fame, they have reached the pinnacle, Steph Curry's team, LeBron James, they have won so many NBA titles, there's nothing more for them to conquer. No more Everest to climb. All the fame, all the money, what makes people turn up on a basketball court in Paris and play their life out to win. When they asked them, do you know what the word was? Their explanation is not I want us to win the gold medal. It's not I want another accolade. You know what they said? This is fun. How was their explanation? This is fun. How is it fun? It is fun because they have found their purpose in life. They have found their path. And when you find your path in life, nothing becomes boring. Nothing becomes a chore. You don't have to ache all over to get up in the morning to go to that task that you are, that you are heading to. And that is what Jesus is inviting people to come into. Come all ye who labor and are heavy laden, take my yoke on you and learn of me, and I will give you rest. So he's calling people a labor, not to drop their labor. He's telling them to unite with me. A yoke was used for one or two reasons. It kind of hooked slaves together so they stay in line or it yoked animals together, especially oxen, so that they stay in line and pull the same furrow when they're plowing a field. So a yoke has this idea of bondage. A yoke has this, connotes this idea of me losing my freedom. I'm yoked to something else. I'm yoked to someone else. Yet Jesus is saying, come and be yoked with me. He's calling us into a yoke, into tying our necks to his, to walk with him, to move with him, that you will give, find rest unto your souls. So he's not saying, give up your labors. That's not rest. Come on to me, all you labor. Yoke yourself with me. Learn of me. That's the key thing. Learn from me. I found peace. I found rest. 
You can't give what you don't have. And Jesus says, take my yoke and you will find rest for your souls. You can't give what you don't have. So Jesus said, I have rest. How did I find rest? I found it by aligning my heart and my purpose with that of my father. All that I do is what I see my father doing. All that I speak or what I hear my father, I'm not out of alignment with him. And that is what brings me peace and rest and make labor something so enjoyable. I found my niche. I found my path. I found my asher. I know which path God has designed for me. And Jesus is saying, if you align with me, if you yoke yourself to me, learn from me, you will also walk in your path. Amen. Praise the Lord. So, <clears throat> in heaven we will continue to work, but from a place of rest, from a place of purpose and identity, we will do what we are built to do. Our works will be in harmony with our purpose. This harmony, despair, and hopelessness arise when we are misaligned with our purpose. And you want to know the reason why so many people are in despair in the world today? You want to know there is so much suicidal ideation among young people? So much mental health illnesses? I will suggest to you something that maybe the medical doctors and nobody else will talk about. It is the result of misalignment of purpose. Of people are in a place that they shouldn't be. Doing what they were not designed to do. Remember I said, as you stood at this fork with all these different paths offering themselves to you, and everyone calling, no one stops and says, God, which is the path for me? Regardless of financial um, I, I, I don't, conditions, I don't, I'm not putting any condition. What is the path for me? When you fearfully and wonderfully made and designed me, what did you design me to do? No one stops at that point. But they follow the friends calling them, hey, come and do this. It's more lucrative. Come and do that. It is more lucrative. The school counselors come to our high schools and they tell us what trades are profitable, what are the best courses of action that's going to provide a living. But it never touches that part of us that says, what did God make me to do? And so we are pulled by all kinds of allurements that take us off track. And so many people will say, end up saying, making the statement that even though they're successful, they're doing well, they have a good job making money, they'll say, I'm only doing this to put bread on the table. When people make that statement, they're basically saying, I'm unhappy with what I'm doing, but it's providing a good living for my family and I. Well, that is what God wants to take us away from. God wants us to take us away from that drudgery, from being misaligned, align us with our purpose, because that is where our joy will come from. Amen? Praise the Lord. So, <clears throat> work will not be tedious in heaven, but enjoyable because we will be doing well what we were intimately built to do. The dead in the Lord are blessed or happy because they're resting from their labors. They have finally found that holy grail where labor and happiness meet. Amen. The second reason for our blessedness or blessed are the dead in the Lord um, is that uh, the second part of this blessedness of the departed saints is that their labors continue to accrue benefits to them. Blessed are the dead in the Lord, they rest from their labors, but their works follow them. Their works follow them. The phrase, their works follow them, means that what they did on earth and the kingdom of God has value beyond time and physical death. The implications of this revelation are powerful and surely incentivizing. Let me explain what I mean. Most Christians I know become disenchanted with life and church because they do not get the recognition they deserve for their contribution to the local assembly. Church hopping is a fallout from this sense of lack of appreciation for one's efforts. 
But the heart of their disillusionment is really a deficient understanding of the place or time of time in the vast expanse of eternity. In God's eyes, time is an infinitesimal part of eternity. In God's eyes, meaning that what is done in time counts in eternity. What this translates to is that rewards and judgments, if not dispensed in time, will be discharged in eternity. <coughs> this is the purpose of judgments. The judgment seat of Christ is for believers, and the great white throne judgment is for unbelievers. And they both suggest that not all the good that is done in time will be re recompensed in this life. And not all evil committed in time will be repaid in this life. These judgments are designed to bring inequities and injustices in time into balance. You read the parable of the rich man and Lazarus, you get a good sense of how this plays out. Abraham said to the man in hell, son, remember that in your lifetime you had good things and this man had suffered evil and bad things, but now everything is reversed. Life is now coming into balance. These judgments uh, are designed to bring balance. What good has not been recognized on earth will be honored in heaven. And what evil has not been punished on earth will be exacted in the hereafter. Concerning rewards and, judgment, and judgments, Jesus actually places a heavier weighting on rewards and executions in the afterlife. A man might be sentenced to jail for a crime here. But if he goes, un if he goes unpunished and does not repent before he dies, the punishment that awaits him is more severe and forever in duration. He might spend a few months in jail, or even a few years in jail, or at worst, even his life in jail. But it's still, if judgment is exacted here, and he repents, he is, if he, uh, he, he will be saved from the, from the future. Whereas if someone dies without repenting of their sin, and many people commit crimes and say, I've gotten off, my wife and I like to look at crime shows, and many of these crimes are unsolved. People have gotten away 20, 30 years, and the crime is unsolved. It is unsolved in time. But they will be caught at the judgment. Because the Bible says the cowardly, the unbelieving, the abominable, murderers, sexually immoral, sorcerers, idolaters, and all liars shall have their part in the lake that burns with fire and brimstone which is the second death, Revelation 21 and 8. <clears throat> Equally, rewards and approbations in time are fleeting, whereas unrecognized goodness in this life is met with a reward that is lasting and incorruptible. There is no double dipping. That's what Jesus taught us. There is no double, di double dipping. He said, if you receive the praise of men, you have your reward. So many Christians, as I said, a lot of church hopping, it's taking place because somebody feels, I've done this, but nobody recognized me. I've done that, but somebody else got a promotion, and so on. And so, so many of us limit everything that's happening in life to time. <clears throat> and Jesus is saying, <clears throat> excuse me, you can't double dip. You can't, if you receive the praise of men, you have your reward. Now, what it boils down to is if I do something for God and nobody recognizes me, I'm happy. Because God is crediting my account in heaven. And when I get to heaven, I will be able to make an abundant entrance because I have something waiting for me. So the Bible speaks, Peter speaks of making an abundant entrance into the everlasting kingdom of our Lord Jesus Christ. How many of us, we long for heaven, we see all the crisis happening around the world, war here, this happening, this, all the crisis and we are like, oh God, Jesus, come soon and take us out of this world. Lovely to be removed. But the first thing that happens after we are taken out of this world, the Bible says we will all stand before the judgment seat of Christ. How many of us are ready 
for the judgment seat of Christ. And that judgment is not to punish us or send us to hell, it's to reward us for our labors. But how many of us are going to go in and say, you know what, I've done all these things in heaven, no, on earth, nobody recognized me, nobody honored me, nobody said thank you, but I know that God is not unrighteous to forget my work and labor of love. And so if I'm not paid here, I can make an abundant entrance into the everlasting kingdom because I've got treasures laid up in heaven that are incorruptible, where no moth and rust can corrupt and where no thief can break through and steal. It is an incorruptible inheritance that I have. So brethren, if you do something for Jesus, you do something good, you do, and nobody recognizes it, it's okay. You can get paid on earth, receive the praise of men, and it's gone tomorrow. But if you don't, God's angels will record. Deed done, not recognize, our credit, brother so-and-so, it's so much. When you get to heaven, you can make an abundant entrance because you have treasures laid up in heaven. Amen. Praise God. So, let me close. Um, let us not become hung up on the acquisition of temporal, visible, and material enrichments, for these cannot bridge the traverse between earth and heaven. If we pray, fast, give, and receive the praise of men, we have nothing to look forward to in heaven. To this end, Jesus exhorts us to a quiet religion. Pray in secret. Give in such a way that your left hand doesn't even know what your right hand is doing. When you fast, anoint yourself so that you don't give any indication that you are fasting. It is God whom we seek to please and to glorify, and he will reward us in due season for our labor of love. Do you want to be happy? We said before that happiness is more than a sentiment or an emotion. Here we are informed that happiness is rooted in a reality that says godly people will never lose each other, ever, but will be together in the ages to come. And that we should not be concerned about earthly rewards, rewards and recognitions for our work, but do it quietly and humbly for the glory of Christ. For he that humbles himself will be exalted. May God bless you. Let's all stand.